Welcome to Gladwin Free Methodist Church. Here's Pastor Phil Hardup with I Follow. Good morning. I am reading from Mark 1, 1 to 20. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord and make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As John, as John, excuse me, as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was in prison, Jesus went to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Thank you, Daisy. pray together one more time. Father, today I pray that you would help me to handle the word in a correct manner. That you would help us all to have our hearts, our minds open to what you have for us this day. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are, um, <clears throat> there are um, some names that I could say of famous people and you will uh, right away begin to think of some things about them. For example, if I say the name Abraham Lincoln, there are some things that you immediately know about Abraham Lincoln. Things that identify his, his presidency and who he was. Our president during the Civil War, um, the choices he had to make. There's been a number of things written by him, and he's identified by those things. If I say the name Mother Teresa, there are immediate, immediately some things that come to your mind that identify her. You may think of the fact that she was a a Catholic missionary to India. She lived her life serving the least and the lost and the left out. She suffered greatly for Jesus. I may say the name Winston Churchill. You may think of the British Prime Minister during World War II and how uh, so many people read and look at and learn from his leadership style. I may say the name Thomas Edison. You may think about an American inventor. You may think about turning the lights on at your house, right? History has much to say about each of these individuals. When we hear their names, we we quickly begin to think of that which identifies them the most. Those are just five random names I just picked out of a list of 100 famous people. They're they're not significant to the message today. Other than I want you to understand, there are famous people you can think of and you quickly will identify them with some main thing or two that they were about. 
History has identified them in that way. I like to read biographies. And when I read them, and I read especially about historical figures, and when I read about their life, or, or maybe I watch a documentary about their life, uh, one of the things I like to notice is I like to notice their choices and decisions that they made in their life. In particular, those choices and decisions that proved to be pivotal in identifying their path, or that shaped them. Those choices that, that ultimately would come to define them. In doing this, I can't help but to look at my own life. And, and as I'm reading um, the story of the life of a historic figure, I will often think back and I will reflect on my, on my life and I will think back to different events and choices and decisions that I've made in the past. And I can think back on those, and I can think of some of those that were, that were important choices that were pivotal in my life, that shaped me. There were choices that changed where I was going, what I was doing. I think about uh, decisions I made, both good and bad. Sometimes decisions were selfish, and they put me on a path that was in the wrong direction and brought consequences that I did not appreciate. Sometimes those choices were choices that put me on a path toward following Jesus. And, and I have found each time that it is those choices that last and those choices that have a greater impact and bring healing and put me on a course of which is much more rewarding. And I think about my current circumstances. I think about current choices that I make, current decisions that I have to make. And I, and I wonder, how will these shape my life? How will these um, have an impact in the future, not only on me, but on others? And this is, this is what I know. What we focus on determines where we are headed. It determines our destination. When uh, one of the things um, I think about, I like to ride a motorcycle, and I will, and I know that when you're on a motorcycle, you're at, in harm's way of people sometimes in cars that might be texting. Don't do that. But one of the things I think about, if you're uh, riding a stretch of highway that has a number of curves on it, and it's maybe unfamiliar to you, there's a tendency we have to look at the corner of the curve and think, that looks a little sharp to me. And if you stay focused on that, you're going to head toward that. You need to learn to look through that, to look where you want to go, and then you will naturally go that direction. You still need to adjust your speed accordingly. But... Our, our, where we focus determines where we will go. Determines our destination. If we are living a life and making choices that are consistent choices and decisions that are not decisions and choices that are in harmony with God's will, our focus will, will go that way. Our direction will go that way. We will become identified by those choices and actions and decisions even though they may be taking us away from Christ, that ultimately will identify us. We need to think about that truth. In just the first 20 verses of the Gospel of Mark, Mark gives us this, this thumbnail sketch of these first several months of Jesus' ministry as he was beginning his public ministry. And we see how important and how pivotal choices are and how they can set a course and how they can identify us for our life. Mark introduces us to John the Baptist. John was Jesus' earthly cousin, and John came to, came to be through really God's uh, miracle working on his parents' life. His parents were very old and had been praying, and, and, and the Lord saw that they would have John. And John was given this calling to be the one who would make the way for the Lord, who would, who would set the path straight for the Messiah, who would, who would teach the truth that the Deliverer, the one who would forgive sins was here. John the Baptist was obedient to that calling, and he was obedient to the calling of God, and he brought that message. And that message connected with people, connected with people so much so that they came out to see him in the desert. 
He wasn't encumbered by any of the trappings of the world. He, he lived in the desert. He had um, really a way about him that was, that was um, not encumbered by anything. His diet was locust and wild honey. That doesn't sound all good to me. The honey part sounds okay. But they came to him, they came to hear his truth, and they came out to hear from him, and he would teach them to live a life in keeping with repentance. He would teach them that that there is a way to live repented and surrendered to the will of God in your life. So how do you live a life in keeping with repentance? Luke tells us in his account that people came to him from every walk of life, and they asked him what they should do in in their chosen occupation. And he would tell them, you should live a way, you live your life and do your job in a way that honors the Lord. For me as a follower of Christ, to live my life in keeping with repentance is to live my life knowing, knowing full well that my life is not my own. It is surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ that I follow Him. I've turned from one way of living to following Christ. That's what repenting means. And to live in a pattern of repentance is to live surrendered to that will. It's to know when when I am facing temptation to be mindful. No, my life is not in that direction. My life is following Christ. When I fail, and I have failed, it is surrendering to God completely again and asking Him to reorient my life to the truth of the cross of Christ. God calls us to live in this relationship with Him. Surrendered to His will for us. So John brought this message. And when John saw Jesus, when John saw Jesus coming to Him where He was preaching and teaching and baptizing, He said to Jesus in this prophetic moment, He says, This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When he called Jesus the Lamb of God, it made the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day, it made them nervous. Because when he called Jesus the Lamb of God, he was saying, this is the one who will suffer and die. He is without blemish. He will die for your sins. It made them nervous. Because he was telling them that Jesus is the one. He is the fulfillment of prophecy. People came from every walk of life to be baptized by John. And then I I want to remind you of this, church. People are hungry for Jesus. You know, there's an enemy. His name is Satan. And he's a liar. He's never told the truth. He's the father of lies. And he would like to convince us, church, that there are people out there who are just happy not to know Jesus. There are people out there who are hungry to know Jesus. There are people out there who want to know about the Jesus that you follow, about the Jesus that has changed your life. And He calls you and I, church, to be faithful in making that love known. He may not call you to preach in front of a congregation. There's more to it than that. My greatest witness as a follower of Christ is not when I'm here. It's when I'm living my life. It's when I'm interacting with people in the community. It's when I'm obeying Him as a a husband and as a father. God calls you to be His witness. God calls you to live your life in a different way. During the time of Jesus' ministry, in in, in that culture, um, baptism was a way in which people used to publicly show that they identified with the messenger and the message they were bringing. So when people came to John and they heard his message and they heard him proclaim that there is this way to live that is in repentance and surrender to the will of God, that the Messiah has come, that he will forgive sins, he will bring healing, they, would, they were saying, I identify with that. My life is, is wrapped up in that truth. And so they were being baptized saying, I identify with the, with the messenger and with the message that John brings. But more importantly, they were saying, I believe who Jesus is. And what identified them was the fact that they were baptized because Jesus is the Messiah. They were identifying that that is true. It's it's interesting, one of the passages I I love is at the beginning of John, I think it's in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John. It talks about how, 
how the, some of the Pharisees were upset that Jesus was baptizing even more people than John. And, and then it says this, but in fact Jesus did not baptize them, his disciples did. And you know what's cool about that? Is that the power of the name of Jesus is so strong that when they were baptized, it was evident that they followed Jesus. That's what identified them. So much so that they said, Jesus has baptized them. See, today, when you witness the baptism, when you see Cole baptized and Michelle baptized, they're not going to say, oh, I was baptized by Phil. Mm -mm. They're baptized because of Jesus. And they identify with Him and who He is and what He's doing in their life. So people came to Jesus, came to, came to John the Baptist. They're being baptized. They were, were receiving that truth. Baptism is about identifying that my life belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. This was no small thing. It's still no small thing. And really that's still true in our culture today. We have this understanding that when, when I am baptized in the name of Jesus, it is proclaiming that something is different about me. There are places, and there have, been, there have been times in history, and there are still places today, that when, when a father of Christ goes public with baptism, their life becomes at risk. But it's still important for them to say, I am a follower of Christ. I'm completely immersed and identified who Jesus is and what he's doing in my life. So it's interesting. We know, we look at this passage, and we know that, uh, that Jesus came to John to be baptized. And I think about that with the world. Jesus didn't need to repent. The Bible says he's without sin. He committed no sin. He's the perfect Lamb of God. But yet, he came to John to be baptized. And, and John is, is kind of torn up by this. He says, why do, why do you come to me to be baptized? I should be baptized by you. I'm not even worthy to put your sandals on. And Jesus tells him, this must be done to fulfill, to fulfill all that God has said. I mean, John had been teaching that, that, you know, I baptize you with water, I'm baptizing you, and you're identifying with what I'm teaching, with what I'm telling you, but there's one coming, he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He has the power to literally transform and change your life. But Jesus needed to be baptized. You said, well, why did Jesus need to be baptized? He needed to be baptized to show us why He came. To help us understand more fully who He is. To reveal to us that Jesus is a King, and He is a servant, and He is a Son. Jesus left the splendor of heaven. The Bible tells us in the first chapter of John, He left the splendor of heaven. He came to that which was His own, the world. He created the world. God the Son and God the Father, God the Holy Spirit are one. He left the splendor of heaven and came to this earth that He made. And He came here in an ordinary way. He came here as an infant. Lived with us. Walked with us. He's a king, but He's a servant. He came a servant of all. My king came a servant of all. My king came... To take care of the problem of my sin and your sin. Because he's my servant. My king washed 30 feet of disciples. Jesus is a king and he's a servant and he's a son. He gave up his rights as creator. He lived among us. He was God in flesh. So Jesus went out to the wilderness where John was teaching along the Jordan where, and proclaiming the words of the prophets concerning the Messiah. And Jesus, in obedience, and to fulfill the purpose for which he came, came to John and he was baptized. He was identifying with the truth of the message of this messenger saying, this is, this is true. This is who I am. And in that moment, Jesus identified that truth that he was here as servant of all to carry out the will of the Father. When you're baptized, 
and you're immersed in who Jesus is, you're giving up your rights, you're saying, I belong to Jesus Christ. I'm celebrating the fact that I'm dead to the sin that used to be at work in my life. I'm alive in Christ. I am a new creature. I am made clean by the blood of Jesus and who He is. In the Gospel of Luke, in, verse, verse, in chapter 3, verse 21... It says this, When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. As Jesus was baptized, he was praying. And the Holy Spirit shows up, as a dove and it lands on him and there's this audible voice from heaven you are my son whom I love with you I am well pleased how cool is that what an affirmation for Jesus everything Jesus did on this earth he did he did in relationship with his father in heaven and this is the first time that we see in Scripture where, where God the Father spoke to him in an audible voice so that everyone else heard it as well. He was affirmed by his Father in heaven. There are things that I want to see when I get to heaven. And there's got to be like, like, a, like a heaven YouTube thing, right? Where you can go back and say... Jesus being baptized, you know, type it in. Because I want to see the people there in the wilderness on the Jordan when God spoke in this audible voice and said, This is my son, whom I love. I don't know what he sounded like. I don't know if he's a, I don't know if he's a baritone or a tenor. I don't know. Morgan Freeman. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Please no. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Um, but you know, that, to see the people around and hear that, that would have heard that and saw that happen, they knew that something miraculous was going on. And for Jesus, remember Jesus was fully God who was fully man. He became, he was God in flesh. He lived with us and walked with us. So, so here Jesus in, in, in his humanity, hears affirmation from his Father. I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you identified with the person and work of Jesus in your life? See, we're given this promise as followers of Christ that we're, that we're heirs with Christ. We're His very children. Do you identify with the person and work of Jesus in your life? Jesus went from the defining moment of surrender to the will of Father and obedience and being served of all to being led where He would be tempted for 40 days. And down the road we'll have a, we'll have a message where Jesus, and, and we'll unpack more about, about why Jesus was tempted and how important that is. Mark tells us that this, after that period of time, Jesus came back and he began to preach. And he also was preaching this message of repentance. You know, and we need to think about how important repentance is. Sometimes we don't hear that enough. But repentance is a willingness to, to, to identify and say, I am on my own, I am going in a direction that is wrong. And I'm turning from that direction and I'm following Jesus. And in, in, in our humanity, in my humanity, sometimes I want to follow Jesus and I want Him to tell Him everything that's going to happen along the way. Lord, you need to give me a lot of clarity, right? God doesn't work that way. In fact, if you read the Bible, uh, throughout the Bible, those who follow Jesus, God didn't tell them everything that was going to happen along the way. He just said, follow me. And they walked through a lot of hard things as they followed, as they followed God. And God is always faithful. So Mark tells us that Jesus began to preach this message of repentance and then he began to call people to be his followers and he calls those first disciples who become his apostles and he says to them, come and follow me. And it says that once they left their nets and they began to follow him. Right away. 
There's no time for delay. There's no sense in, in, uh, in hanging around and debating with God. They just obeyed and they followed. Jesus calls us to follow Him. Are you willing to follow Him right now in this moment? To follow Him, not distracted by what you're currently doing, about what your occupation is, about what you do for your livelihood, about where you live right now. Will you just say, okay, Lord, I'll follow you. And then will you trust Him to begin to shape you and to teach you? And, and as He teaches you, He'll show you what's next and where you need to be and where you need to go. Will you follow Jesus? The moment you put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ, the moment you say, He is my Savior, that's the moment that you begin to be identified as a follower of Christ. Are you following Him? This morning, if, you're, if, you, if you hear that question, are you following Him? I want to, I want to ask you this, this, this follow-up. If you're not following Him, who are you following? Or what are you following? If it's not Jesus, why not? Maybe there, there are times where people say, I can't follow Jesus because I'm not ready yet. I'll follow Jesus when I'm at a different point in my life. When I'm done with this season in my life, then I'll follow Him. That's a lie from the enemy. It makes, there, there, there's nothing better than following Jesus. There's nothing you're missing out by, uh, by following Jesus today. There's nothing you can live for that will bring you fulfillment like following Jesus. Today is the time to say, Oh, Lord, I will follow you now. I'll leave the trappings of whatever it is, and I'll follow you now. This morning, as we pray, I want you to know that God loves you with everything He has. That when in Hebrews where it talks about how we have a high priest who understands us and knows us, that's true. I want you to think about how important it is to, that we have, um, that we follow the Lord Jesus Christ who is a king, who is a servant, and who is a son. He has the authority to forgive sin. But yet because He walked this earth, God in flesh, we can identify with Him with confidence in knowing He understands the struggles that I walk through. We serve a God who is, who is King and servant and a Son who has always proved to be faithful in every matter. Sometimes I will be... Um, meeting with someone who is going through a tragedy in their life. And sometimes the conversation comes to the question, why is God allowing this to happen in my life? Or sometimes it's even more, why is God doing this to me? And I've learned that there are questions that are for me to answer sometimes. But there are those times when as a follower of Christ, I must trust Him in the truth of knowing that He is faithful to walk with people. And it is those times that, that I have to go to Him in prayer and say, Lord, unleash Your power and make Your love known. And give me the opportunity to, make, to do my part in sharing that love. Next Saturday morning we have a prayer time here at the church at 8 o'clock and you're invited to come. And I hope you do. But we're going to be, we're going to be learning, we're going to be doing a devotion and learning about the power, about praying God's power. And then we're going to go spend some time in prayer in our community, praying outside of our school and asking for the Lord to intercede this year.
we need to know that in the midst of, of, of the trials of life, God is faithful. And in this broken world, we will walk through things that we can't answer right away how God's working. But, but we need to have the confidence and assurance that God will work. And God loves you. Spend some time reading the Psalms and you will see that about 70% of the Psalms, the psalmist is lamenting. In other words, he's asking God things like, where are you? But as he spends time with God, God who loves us with everything he has, brings him to the conclusion that God is still faithful. He is still his refuge and God is still his rock. I pray that's true for you. I pray that, that, um, that you have surrendered your life to Christ. And later on today, when you hear, hear the questions of baptism, if you've been a follower of Christ, um, and you, you were baptized a long time ago, listen to those questions and allow those questions to be reaffirmations in your own walk. Maybe you were baptized recently. Listen to those questions again and allow yourself to, to reaffirm in your life the importance of who Christ is. Let's stand and let's pray together. Father God, this morning I thank you for moving upon us. Thank you for the power and presence of your Holy Spirit that is moving in this place. And Father, I am aware that there may be someone here this morning who needs, who needs to be prayed with. They, 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 um, they're, maybe they're walking through a difficult time and they, they just need uh, two or three brothers and sisters in the Lord to gather with them and pray. Lord, right now they can, they can slip out, they can come forward, and they can meet at the front. And they can kneel or sit, and we would be glad to pray with them. Lord, there may be someone here this morning who is making a decision to follow you. And they need to go public with that by, by, um, by coming forward and kneeling so people can pray. Or maybe they need to, to, to stay after and talk with Pastor Steve or myself or a praise team member. We would be glad to pray with them and talk with them. Father, if there are people here who are needing to make that decision, I pray that they would not let this day end without making that decision. It's a pivotal time in their life. Father, I ask that you would help us as men and women who follow you to consider our choices, our decisions, to consider the events and circumstances in our life and to uh, do a type of inventory in our life and ask ourselves the question, are my choices and decisions Choices and decisions that reflect your working in my life, that reflect that I identify with you. Father, help us to live life in keeping with repentance, in keeping with who you are and who we want to become as you shape us. Father, today I pray that you would bless us in the in baptismal service. I pray that we would um, truly see um, and celebrate what you are doing, and we thank you. Uh, for who you are, for your great love, and I thank you for this church. We pray this all now in Jesus' name. Amen.